good afternoon, everybody. It's so good to see you all on this beautiful March day, or February day, almost to March. It feels like March weather, doesn't it? <laughs> so getting started today, we are here and joining together this afternoon to talk about climate action and the impact that we can make upon our community. We have an array of amazing talent from the entire St. Louis area that are going, and also Kansas City, that are going to be joining us this afternoon. Um, we have Dr. Leanne Neal um, from Shawnee Mission School District joining us, as well as, well as Todd, Todd Clower from the Upper School Principal, and Sammy Aaron, who is with the Resilient Activists, and Rebecca Weaver from Missouri City's Program Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And then we also have a Green Schools Quest project update from Meredith Jock with Parkway Sparks Bioscience Program, as well as Lynn Scott from Principia. So thank you so much all for joining. As you have questions and during today's presentation, feel free to share them in a, the chat and different moderators um, for the presentations will be able to answer them. Also, if you wanted to have verbal discussion, that will also be provided at the conclusion of all of the pre presentations shared today. So thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully it'll be very insightful and informative and gather, um, provide for your next actions in our community. So without further ado, we will start with Dr. Leanne Neal. Dr. Neal. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce my um, co-presenter, Joan Levins. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Good to be here. OK. Um, Joan and I are here to, um, to share with you. Hold on just a second. I don't see this moving. Here to share with you a little bit about are you still able to see this, my screen? Yes. I'm having trouble getting it to advance for some reason. Let's see if we can try this one more time. True. No, no problem. <laughs> talk through it. And if need be, um, you can, you're you welcome to take it out of present mode and, and just kind of toggle through the slides to the side. Yeah, um, let's see if that'll work. We're, we're open to, to either. <laughs> there we go. Let's see if we can make that work. All right. So Joan and I are pleased to be here to share with you just a little bit about some of our sustainability um, activities that we've done in the Shawnee Mission School District. I currently oversee early childhood and sustainability uh, in Shawnee Mission, which is a, on the Kansas side of the state line, um, a suburb of Kansas City, Missouri. But I actually took the baton from Joan, who um, I like to call her our coordinator of sustainability emeritus. She really gets the lion's share of the credit for um, the passion and getting um, really getting the um, projects off the ground. And so um, we'll just tag team today. Um, we were invited just to share with you a little bit about um, how some of the things that we're doing, uh, particularly around a sustainability youth summit that we have found to be particularly uh, empowering for students and um, has had some really great outcomes. And so um, we'll just get started. Um, feel free if you've got questions, we're happy to take those at the end or at the end of the entire presentations. Um, we just thought it would be helpful for you to, um, first of all, there's a great shot of kids, that's always the best, um, but to tell you a little bit about our school district, we have uh, over 27,000 students, about 51 sites, uh, and um, we're located within a 72 square mile area with a, a large number of acres um, within the school district that we maintain. Also unique um, for us is that we straddle multiple, in fact, seven watersheds um, that I think works in our, um, kind of works in our best interest. Joan might be able to talk a little bit about some of those curriculum tie-ins that we do around water quality and things. So that's been helpful for us. But then we also um, serve 14 different um, cities or towns, municipalities, um, nine of which we have schools in. And so that's just a little bit in a nutshell about the Shawnee Mission School District. Um, Joan, you want to talk a little bit about the history of the sustainability efforts? Sure. Um, 
in back in 2015, uh, there was a survey of stakeholders of the district and sustainability was identified as one of the top priorities. Um, in particular, our um, parent groups were already starting to compost in various schools throughout the district, but there was no consistency between each of those efforts. And so the district formulated this position of sustainability um, coordinator in order to facilitate some of the institutionalization of, of composting, for example, throughout the district. Um, in order to set the priorities for that new position, uh, we decided that we'd start with our students. And so students from all five or all six district high schools were invented to, invited to attend a summit um, at the Johnson County Community College to sort of learn some background on sustainability issues, um, but then also to identify the priorities, the sustainability priorities for the district, which we found to be very powerful. Um, I found that it was helpful to say, these are our students' priorities. It seemed to hold more weight than saying, even that this is the superintendent's priorities or the board of education's priorities. Um, so therefore we'd like to share this with you. In 2021, last October, um, Leanne can tell about this. So we actually replicated um, the youth summit um, in uh, earlier this year, back in the fall. Again, we followed a similar model. We brought um, students and teachers from each of our six high schools together. And we really intentionally asked um, the teachers to make sure that they invited um, a, a cross age group, not just seniors, um, but we really wanted to try to engage some of the underclassmen as well, um, students that would be with us for multiple years to be able to see some of those priorities and, and to engage in some of that work over time. Um, they came back together. We again relied heavily on um, our community partners. We're fortunate in this area to have um, a lot of um, folks at the county level, Mid-America Regional Council, our cities, um, and some elected officials that uh, really embrace um, and feel that sustainability and um, climate action related items are, are critical and important. So they came alongside and, and, and provided sort of that expert um, professionals in the field um, breakout sessions with students to give them some um, context and, and information about um, what's happening in the region and, and some of the issues um, even globally. But then also we had them review and look at those initial priorities that were set with the first summit and then determine what priorities and action steps did they want moving forward to drive the next uh, five years of work um, in, in terms of that planning. So I, I think I would start by saying that connecting, as Joan mentioned, connecting or identifying those ties to your just to like a district or an organizational, if you weren't a school district, to your organizational strategic plan is really critical um, to sort of set that stage for how that work is connected. Joan? Um, we also engaged um, some of the, as Leanne said, the subject matter experts to come and present to our students. Um, as part of that process, we had the students come together with, with each of these experts to sort of learn about the topic, hear what the students had to say, what they, what they brought to the experience, and then put the students back together in their small groups by high school to share what they learned and to generate some ideas um, and what were their top priorities um, for the district. What did they see as the most important steps that needed to be taken? Um, once they identified those priorities, they, we had them um, put them up on, on uh, poster sheets around the room. And then they went around and through a group process, the group.ocracy sort of voting, they decided their top three priorities or top five priorities. Um, they then broke up again into small groups by interest um, and identified the action steps that they would like to take under each of those topics. Um, we found it was important to share this, this process with the Board of Education and we're fortunate to get on their agenda and, um, and a very lively discussion ensued, which was, which was you know, one of those things when students are in control, <laughs> go, maybe go places, um, but it was really a, a wonderful exchange between the Board of Education and the students. 
gives you um, just kind of a context for some of the folks that were there um, with those breakout sessions. We had partners from our local um, our area, Bike Walk KC, talking about some transportation and walkability elements. Uh, we had engaged um, a partner with uh, Evergy around um, some of the renewable energy and, and like a EV charging stations, those kind of things. Uh, we had um, probably one of the most lively pieces of discussion was um, a sustainability specialist from an area um, uh, architect firm came and talked about the design process um, as part of our kind of our lead discussion um, that we were working on in some of our bond um, construction. We invited this um, individual to come in and that was probably, she was the one that really connected the most with the students, really talking around that health and wellness um, and mental wellness and well-being that really resonated, in fact, resonated so greatly with the students that it was broader and bigger really than just sustainability. So we pulled it out of the priorities and actually made it sort of a strand that would go uh, weave through um, instead of just being a singleton priority. Here is a sample of uh, what the outcome was uh, from that 2021 Youth Summit. You can see that um, largely the original priorities um, remained intact uh, in there, um, but the um, where they fell in terms of priority listing shuffled a bit. Um, renewable energy was uh, one that was particularly um, uh, resonated with the students and they were really interested in in um, learning more and um, seeing how that could be connected with our schools. Um, the idea around um, making sure that schools had every school has a garden or a natural space for learning was really important to them. Uh, Kickstarting um, the composting and recycling program um, during the pandemic, you can imagine that that kind of has ebbed and flowed a bit. Um, and as high school students, they they really articulated, we were really good at this at elementary school. And we were still pretty good at middle school, but now that we're at high school, we have some work to do. And so um, out of these priorities, um, now as we move forward, we're looking at some student client projects to help us um, do some work to move some of these and advance some of these ideas going forward. This is just an example of some of the, the um, action steps that the students came up with regarding the composting, their priority three, kickstarting uh, the composting initiative once again. Piece of this is that um, we're really relying upon student leadership. Um, that's a piece that has been there in some schools and not in others. And um, we're really excited that the students are engaged in this one and add, put, continue to put this one forward. Um. One of the pieces I think that fits the really, really well with where we're going in education and what we're trying to accomplish today is around that real world learning. And um, that's why I, I said that our community partners and partnerships are so critical um, for us to be able to, to do that. Even the student client projects, bringing in some of our partners to help with that. Um, one of the things that they want to do is um, is measure some measure resources and energy of um, reusable trays versus compostable, um, and figure out um, you know what's best and in on different fronts and moving forward. And so, um, trying to align those um, those goals and those partnerships are really important. Joan. Then well, and just that again, many of our partners have the same goals. Our goals align so that while the cities are required. Um, by, um, by law to have clean water or reduce solid waste, um, they are willing to come in and speak with our students and partner with us in, in those efforts. So I know our time is short, so we we'll probably need to wrap up, but this is an example of the partnerships around composting. The county will give us staffing as well as stipends. Um, the state used to give us some grants. EPA provides us technical assistance. We have a com commercial composting partner that we serve as their model. So they tend to be really helpful in providing resources to us. And then utilizing the district communications department to tell the story is really important and helpful. 
So as we conclude, you know, just continuing to really look for, if you're interested in doing this, uh, looking for those connections with your community uh, partners, people that have common goals, involving the students and the leadership and, and the voice uh, that they lend has been really important, not just in the school district, but in the community. And then that opportunity to celebrate or memorialize that process um, by sharing out um, at the board uh, meetings and other community meetings we found to be really helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Nia and Joan. This was amazing. What incredible connections that you've made for your entire area in Kansas City and the empowerment of your change makers with your high school students and just spreading the wealth and voices of change, taking action. It's amazing and continued best wishes and good luck as you continue in the future. I'm personally anxious to see how Shawnee Mission continues across 2022 and beyond because you are doing profound things and it's amazing to see, especially with the relationships with all the incredible organizations. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us next now to Todd Clower. Todd is the upper school principal and college, excuse me, college guidance director for Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy. And he's going to share how HBHA has engaged students in policy advocacy. So Todd, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's nice to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what my students have done in partnership with students from other schools. Uh, and so I'm gonna jump right in. that working okay? Yes, looks great. Great. So our school uh, for the last eight years has had what we call a social justice partnership. And that includes three metropolitan Kansas City high schools. And for two years, between, beginning in 2019, we focused specifically on climate change awareness and mitigation in Kansas City. And to kick it off, I'm just gonna share a little bit of what our students did. Uh, and this is a video that they created from scratch. The climate is changing, and we're seeing the impact of it in our own world now more than ever. We are Future Votes KC, and we are here to talk about global warming, how it impacts the KC metro area, and what you can do to help address climate change using Metro KC Climate Action Coalition's Climate Fund. We are a partnership of young leaders from three KC Metro high schools, Hyman Brand Hebrew Academy, University Academy, and Academy Lafayette. This is our seventh year striving to make positive improvements to our city. Now, we are focusing on climate change and what our community needs to do to help protect our planet. And it starts with you. Climate change leaves our population vulnerable in a number of ways. It affects everybody, but not everybody equally. Of the 2.1 million residents in the KC Metro area, Elderly, poor, and communities of color are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. One big impact that is happening are extreme increases in precipitation and temperature. The amount of annual rainfall and the average annual temperatures are increasing. Additionally, the amount of dry days without rain has risen. Projections show the number of extremely hot days over 105 degrees surging from less than 1 per year to 20 per year in the next several decades. These shifting weather patterns can lead to a number of phenomena, including drought, more thunderstorms, floods, and severe winter weather. The consequences of these can lead to disease, hospitalizations, property and infrastructure damage, and even death. Climate change impacts all of us, especially those that society too frequently overlooks, and it is our job to do what we can to counteract its effects. We're in danger. If the rate of emissions continues to increase the way it is today, our world will face the consequences. In order to sustainably live, we need to decrease emissions by 80% by the year 2050. Our main concern is greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gases are gases that contribute to the greenhouse effect by absorbing infrared radiation. These gases have many detrimental effects on our environment, like wildfires, extreme weather, and the changing climate. The three main contributors to greenhouse gas emissions are residential buildings, commercial and industrial buildings, and on-road transportation being the greatest contributor. Focusing on these three factors will help us reach our goal to lower emissions and achieve a 80% decrease by 2050. So that wasn't the entire video. I just shared a clip with you. So you get a sense of what our students did. What they did was they learned about different components of climate change and then also mitigation efforts. And then use the video to do local advocacy with elected officials so that they can make policy changes. 
So a quick summary, we have three schools as they mentioned in the video, and we have about 12 to 20 students participate in any given school year. And they're called future votes KC because they see themselves as future voters who are going to advocate for things that relate to injustice in our local community. What they also do is they look at upstream solutions. So as much as we do, do, look at, do look at things in our local schools and communities, we really are interested in what are the policymakers doing at the local and regional level that will have an actual impact on what happens in our community. And so the students, as they venture into these topics, which they choose to focus on, um, they look for those upstream solutions and they also do direct advocacy work. So we've actually had students on the top floor of City Hall in Kansas City, Missouri, meeting with the mayor. Uh, that was a few years ago, and that was talking about police community relations. Uh, we've met with city, city officials from five different cities in Kansas City, um, and most of that was related to work on climate change. They also do hands-on work because not all of it is as exciting as meeting with the mayor or holding candidate forums. So we do do hands-on service work that's con connected to the projects that we have. Um, that was a little bit interrupted by COVID, uh, but it is generally a goal that we have in any given year that we work on this. So as school leaders, um, there's leaders and teachers. So I'm, I'm a principal. All the other people from the other schools are teachers who have taken this on as a leadership role within their school. We focus on the relationships between our students because they have different backgrounds and experiences. And we want those differences to actually inform the way we look at issues and how we come up with solutions. Uh, we set goals at the beginning of the year so that we really think about what we can accomplish and we believe that we can accomplish significant things that our students can be proud of. We also work with community organizing groups. The organization that we work with most, most recently in Kansas City is called More Squared, which is the Metropolitan Organization for Racial and Economic Equity. And their professional staff works with our students to do the organizing tasks that are necessary to do that direct advocacy. Uh, the hardest part of our work is the logistical challenges between the school schedules because almost all of what we do happens during the school day. Uh, and so how to navigate three different school schedules, calendars, et cetera, so that everybody is able to work their best and accomplish the goals that we set. So these are some projects that we've done over the past eight years. Um, the things that we're particularly proud of in addition to the climate change is we've had city council and KC mayoral candidate forums that were completely run by the students. We also passed the Healthy Homes ballot initiative, helped to do pass that ballot initiative in Kansas City, Missouri, which affects um, 250,000 renters in the city. Uh, and that our students can point to these things and say, we actually have made a difference. And right now the students have chosen to work on the local control of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. If you're a Kansas City area resident, you might've heard of that, but that's the fact that the state board or a state appointed board actually oversees the police department, not a locally elected one. So we see this as a, as a process that begins with a lot of learning and then it's action and activism towards the goals that the students identify and set in any given school year. It's a really interesting process to watch our students um, ask questions about complex issues and then pick parts of it that they feel like they can really focus on and ask for change. So the challenges in, these, in this kind of relationship is the relationships in the team building um, because especially for the last two years, the COVID pandemic has meant that we've done a lot of things virtually and it's just not the same as being in the same room with somebody that you've never met before and have, has a different back background. As I mentioned, the logistics are challenging and the adults really have to commit. We spend probably twice as much time planning as we do action and um, interaction with our students because we really want it to be meaningful for them. And we each year have a reflective process with the students where we talk about how we do it better and how we engage them to both the learning, the action and the relationship building that they do. Uh, the big things that we did with our environmental action is we met with local elected officials and talked to them about the climate action plan that the Climate Action KC organization has created and is pushing for. And so, they were actually asking elected officials to look at five different areas 
to make changes in policy that they had. And it even gets down into the weeds like green building codes that our students learned about and said to city officials, these are the kinds of things that are easy, low hanging fruit that can make a significant difference with greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's what they did last spring um, to some great success and, and some difficult challenges too. So that is what we do um, and continue to do with our schools and we continue to be inspired by the energy and effort that our students put into it. Uh, and it is an effort where we are using a justice lens and we're very clear about that in what we do. And so when you hear things in the video about communities of color being more affected by things like climate change, our students really learned about that in a deep and significant way and applied that in the way that they spoke to officials. It wasn't simply, um, to say this affects everybody, yes, it does. Um, but we also know that the people who are the have going to have the hardest time are going to be most affected by it. And so we were particularly inspired by the, the amount of energy and research they put into that component of their activism. Such an incredible story, Todd. And as it was shared in the comment, the list of progress that has been going on for almost a decade. How astounding. Um, I'm personally curious to find out have, if you've done like a five year removal and did an audit to see where these students are now and what actions they're taking as they've grown in their fields and their professions and got further graduate study. Um, I'm anxious to hear about that. So incredible stories. Thank you again so much for sharing Todd. It's awesome work that we're hearing from the Kansas City side of our state. Great, great jobs. Well, the next part of our afternoon together will be um, with Sammy Aaron, who is the founder of The Resilient Activist, and she's going to share resources available through The Resilient Activist, whose mission is to build resilience, optimism, and hope in response to impact of the climate crisis. So Sammy, the floor is now yours. Thanks so much, Tracy. I am just, I don't know, so uplifted. Just I've known what Shawnee Mission Schools have been doing for a long time and have known Joan for a long time, but just to, to hear the depth and the breadth that um, these local school districts are taking for not just climate change, but uh, that whole broad education piece for students is just, it's amazing. So um, I'm the founder of The Resilient Activist. We are a um, nonprofit whose mission is to build resilience, optimism, and hope in response to the impact of the climate crisis. And the organization founded on a difficult, my older son to suicide. Um, he had been an environmental activist. He was working on a master's degree in urban and regional planning. He was in a joint law program and there was a point where he just felt that there was so many things that needed to be changed. The emotional impact of all the social injustices that went along with the climate injustices um, just really brought him down and he felt that he wasn't going to make any difference. And so in this intervening 19 years, um, I've had in the back of my mind these words resilient activist because those words don't typically go together and so um, i've been really grateful to be able to create this silver lining um, over his struggles and um, have this organization ready to um, provide the world with support and services we need for um, building inspired and visionary activists who have the resilience to see us through these unprecedented times. So um, environmental grief is young people these days that really consider themselves activists from even upper grade school level all the way through high school and into college. In 2020, the Resilient Activist sponsored a focus group research study. We partnered with, <clears throat> pardon me, the psychology department at KU. We had 46 people from around the world who identified as environmental activists, and they participated in 90 minute small group discussions to explore their thoughts and feelings about the climate crisis. And here's what we learned. Sadness. Anger and frustration were the most commonly used words in this study. And there was a recent study 
done on 10,000 young people um, that paralleled this response. So this is a really um, clearly defined mental health situation that we're going through right now with all of our young people and anybody really who's tuning into what's happening with the climate and especially those who feel that they're taking on an activist role. There are some new words out in the in the mental health community, things like eco anxiety, um, dreading environmental collapse and feelings of helplessness, pre traumatic stress disorder. So people who are studying what uh, the, what the science says have an emotional fear of what's going to happen in the future, they worry that it's going to happen in their area. Solastalgia is the concept of feeling loss and grief over destruction of habitat. So their favorite places in nature that are being destroyed either by man-made um, destruction, you know, development and that kind of thing, or um, by some of the severe weather events that are happening. There's a whole set of emotional components that go with that. And then there's even some anger, some violence coming out of this, terra fury. I mean, it's earth and anger. That word goes together. So fortunately, there are two new organizations that have just started in the last about three years. The Climate Psychology Alliance, there's one in the UK, this one's of North America, and the Climate Psychiatry Alliance. They have created a Climate Aware Therapist Pledge and actually have a resource on their website where they can search. Uh, you can go in and search by your state and your city to see if there are any therapists there. So it's a, it's a different mental health protocol dealing with people who are um, responding in a very normal way to uh, some awful situations that are happening. This is different than working with people who have mental health issues. Um, we talk about the resilient activist living our lives through the five essentials for a resilient world. And I'm not going to spend time on that today, but it's been a great wrapper to help us teach people how to not only be activists, but to be activists in a way that's also self-sustaining and self-supporting. Um, we know that those activists who just give and give and give and never give back to themselves, at some point they will experience burnout, um, um, depression, right? So one of the things that I wanted to share with this group today was some experiences I've had with some teachers at some schools because I think that a lot of teachers maybe are just getting into teaching climate aware cl classes and having the kids do projects, or maybe they're they're expanding what they've been doing, but might not really be um, aware of the impact that might be on themselves. So teachers um, actually can be triggered themselves right? just by hearing things that their students are researching. There can be this emotional <sighs> deep grief that comes up just by learning more and more from your students. I had a sociology professor from Washburn connect with me about a year ago. She had made an assignment to her students to floored at how upset the students were learning about these as this aspect of what's happening in their lives. So I invite you to think about that, to be aware of it. I'm going to um, see if I can go to a different screen here. No, not there, just a minute. And we have, there's a couple of um, upcoming classes that the Resilient Activist has. We have a seven month meditation course coming up. I want you to make note of the one in August taught by Pam Hausner with the uh, Midwest Alliance for Mindfulness, and it's called the Resilient Family. How will we respond to global warming? And that is based, going to be based on the book, All the Feelings Under the Sun. Um, let me see if I can get to that. 
There it is. I'm going to go back here. Um, All the Feelings Under the Sun is a book written by <clears throat> climate psychologist Leslie Davenport. It's how to deal with climate change, and it has to do with um, focus on upper grade school and teenagers. And it's got some great meditation techniques, um, breathing practices, ways to take the emotional impact of climate change and um, from a student, a child's perspective and figure out some resilience tools and ways to, um, to embrace it in a way that feels a little healthier. There's also another book called, um, The Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool. And I'll put these links in the chat box, but I want to be sure you knew this is geared towards high school and college age students. Um, it is fantastic. Sarah Way is a professor at Humboldt State and um, really has nailed it on how to provide some resilience tools and planning. And um, let me just get back to this here. So there's resources for connecting to nature, and I will put a link to all of these, some great uh, tools and books, resources for getting people out into nature for the healing benefits of time spent in nature, regreening the planet and self-care. We have a lot of tools for how you can do both. Take care of yourself while you're regreening the planet. And we have a bunch of programs. I'm not going to go into all of these. I will let you know we have a couple. We have a full speakers bureau program. We have four different presenters on about 10 or 12 different topics now. Our upcoming events, we have a climate cafe. Our first one will be Tuesday, March 1st in the evening for people to just come and be with whatever emotions they're experiencing. That embodied activism meditation series starts in um, on Mondays in March and um, has explores all different aspects of meditation and, and climate action. We have a Jedi book club and we have a Mighty Networks community line. So that's really it. Um, the legend of the legal and the eagle and the condor is when science and technology collaborate with indigenous nature and with their wisdom. And that's where we are today. That's what's happening. Uh, technology is coming together with um, indigenous wisdom, and that's probably what it's all about. So anyway, I will post some things in the chat box. Thank you so much, Sammy. What inspiration also that you shared and the mindfulness piece, the connecting with nature while still making that ecological change happen. So incredible. And thank you so much for giving us ideas and inspiration as we continue forth and combating against the climate change change that's occurring within our world. We appreciate your time today. Our next presenter is Rebecca Weaver. She is the Missouri City's Program Manager with the Nature Conservancy, and she'll be introducing the St. Louis Eco Urban Assessment Tool, which is an interactive tool visualizing environmental challenges and opportunities available in our St. Louis region. So Rebecca, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Tracy. And uh, I am regretting being uh, position right after Sammy. Um, thank you for sharing all those resources. They'll come in handy maybe about when thinking about the information that I'm about to share with you all. I'm going to drop a link in the chat um, that talks about the resource that I'll share with you today and go ahead and share my screen here. And if someone could just give me a heads up and let me know when you see my slides. We see them, they look great. Okay, great. Um, sometimes I, you can see them and I can't, so that's fun. Um, okay, so um, I'm Rebecca Weaver. I'm the city's program manager for the Nature Conservancy in Missouri. And for those of you who might not be aware of TNC, we are a global environmental nonprofit organization with a mission to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And that is obviously no small task. 
Uh, here in Missouri, uh, we have five conservation priorities that guide our work. Those include biodiversity protection, uh, nature-based solutions, and um, sustainable agriculture, uh, healthy cities, which is the program that I head up, and uh, climate resilience. And these all have overlap and intersections in various, various geographies uh, around the state. So let's see here. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble changing slides. One second. Okay, which slide do you see right now? This is the challenge of having multiple screens. We see the Missouri conservation priorities. Okay. Let's see if I can go. Okay, did it change now? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So the St. Louis Eco Urban Assessment is um, an ArcGIS uh, story map and interactive tool that better enables both public users, uh, decision makers um, to visualize the intersections and relationships between uh, several environmental, socioeconomic, uh, public health and physical factors in St. Louis City, Missouri, St. Louis County, Missouri, St. Clair County, Illinois, and Madison County, Illinois. And uniquely, this tool uh, aims to move beyond uh, challenge mapping and incorporates community asset mapping. So including um, geolocated anchor institutions such as churches and schools. We had the opportunity to work with Hope on incorporating some of the Green Schools Quest data into this. Um, and other place-based organizations to point to where there are opportunities to build coalitions to address some of these challenges in ways that are accountable to the communities who are most impacted by them. So we worked with community partner organizations and environmental justice leaders to outline a set of foundational questions uh, informed by and building off of a similar model out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, so the supporting questions for the assessment looked at flood risk, um, given that we are located in St. Louis in a very water rich region, um, food access, vacancy, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, community assets. So our hope for the creation of this tool was to um, co-create a resource that could not only help aid in the transparent prioritization of our own work, um, but based on community partner feedback, and that could be used by other organizations that we were working with, since oftentimes GIS data can be somewhat inaccessible. So the framing questions um, center frontline communities, and frontline communities are those that experience the impacts of climate change uh, first and worst, oftentimes due to the ongoing legacy of systemic racism and disinvestment. So communities of color and low-income communities um, will be increasingly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and thus uh, served as the basis for this assessment as we worked with our community partners on this project. So this is far from a comprehensive analysis of everything that's happening in the region, but it's a start that's grown out of a number of local initiatives and reports. Um, so, yeah. okay, did the slide change? Not yet. Okay. Change it did not. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> I appreciate the collaboration here. <laughs> the screen grab here um, is from the St. Louis Eco Urban Assessment Tool. Um, it outlines polluvial and fluvial flood risk in the region. Um, so users have the ability to toggle between 100 year and 500 year predicted flood impacts. Um, and as we know, flooding can bear both environmental and economic burdens on uh, major metropolitan areas. Um, and the impacts tend to disproportionately affect low-income communities and communities of color. So the data in this section come from Fathom Flood Risk Intelligence, which is a predictive model based on floodplains and climate change data in 2020. So the tool analyzes both polluvial um, flooding, which occurs when rainfall events exceed surface drainage capacity, uh, causing localized flooding, 
and fluvial flooding, which occurs when a river exceeds its capacity and overtops and inundates surrounding areas. And again, looking at 100 year and 500 year flood magnitudes. And I'll pop open the actual tool so you can kind of see that in real time uh, here in a second. Okay, do you see this next slide, park access? Great. So um, the Trust for Public Land, which many of you may know about, um, they are a nonprofit dedicated to ensuring quality outdoor spaces uh, in every US city. They developed a park score index to assess park access and quality, as well as 10 minute uh, park walk shed. Um, they had previously only done this study for the city of St. Louis. So uh, we adapted their um, research and methodology to expand that to include the other three county areas. Um, so we had more data to look at. Um, but as we know, park access extends past uh, proximity and uh, also includes park quality and not all parks are maintained equally. Um, so in the uh, story map and interactive tool, we break down park equity um, based on a study conducted by Elizabeth Ward, which was assessing equitable access to park spaces in St. Louis, Missouri to look at the intersections of both park quality and equity in conjunction. And uh, another intersection that we looked at, uh, area that we looked at was air quality. Um, so in this, um, with this intersection, um, we assessed, we assess air quality uh, using an intersection method where each factor is assigned a series of scores based on the level of air pollution risk. So in addition to majority of people of color and low to moderate income areas, the following factors are included in the air quality intersection. So close proximity to major roads and highways, uh, known air pollution sites, lower tree canopy coverage areas, um, high share of youth per block group, and zip codes with higher rates of asthma, uh, which is a major challenge in St. Louis, as well as uh, block groups with higher number of demolitions, because we know that exacerbates um, healthy air, uh, uh, air quality challenges. So higher scores are in red, representing areas with more factors contributing to air pollution vulnerability. So I'm going to um, switch screens here and show you the tool itself. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to switch my monitors around. I'm not sure how to um, stop sharing this screen. Let me take a look and see if I might be able to. So I'm not in my usual location, so thanks for bearing with me. And um, back at that link that you placed in the chat box earlier, is that something that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that attendees can use to access the tool itself? Yes, that um, you can go to that tool, uh, that link and the um, link to the tool is in there. So, and I know that we're at, we might be running over my allotted time. So um, the tool is included in that link if you wanna go in and uh, toggle around between the different um, areas and take a closer look at the data that's included and the organizations that contributed their time and resources to the creation of, of this tool. Apologies, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. It's great. Everyone can still um, connect with it and explore 
Um, and thanks for also including all the Green Schools Quest participants on that map too. Um, that does not include this year, but all previous years are, are in there. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And that actually is a perfect segue into this last part of our time together. Um, during the closing experiences for our climate action presentation, we're going to have several different, two different schools who are going to be sharing out their Green Schools Quest project updates. This past year is provided for a hybrid experience for our St. Louis area in pursuing the Green Schools Quest projects. Schools were able to identify a six month project or choose monthly projects based and centered around the rainbow of sustainability. Our first presenter is going to be providing their Green Schools Quest project update is Meredith Jack with Parkway Spark and their bioscience program. So Meredith, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, this is, um, I don't know how many years um, on and off we've been with the Green Schools Quest, but this is the second year in the row with this new hybrid format, which um, I actually like quite a bit because it gives a lot more flexibility. Um, so uh, my mentor that we've had for the last two years is actually on the call. Karen O'Brien is here too. And um, last year we worked together to build um, a project for the students to explore the ways that uh, like building materials and design of structures have become more sustainable. And then um, we had them like hear from different experts in the field and then come up with their own ideas of how to alter just different everyday objects to make them more sustainable. And then they presented those ideas to our panelists that Karen helped me um, pull together. And so that was awesome. And then this year has been a little more chaotic. So we aren't doing kind of like a long-term projects. We're, we're just touching base regularly, kind of going through the resources that Hope is throwing out there, which have been really great. And it's a good way to just kind of like refocus. Um, we meet about once a month and just make sure that um, it's kind of like always at the forefront of my planning is like what I can incorporate in terms of green um, practices and sustainability and things like that. Um, Karen, is there anything you wanna add? Um, no, that pretty much covers it. I think that um, what I really like about the flexible format is that one, it just allows space for life, right? Like we've had to adjust um, our schedules based on virtual or in person, or if the school was even letting people visit um, and it's, it's given us a lot of flexibility. And um, I think just having the kids have another person from industry to give them a different perspective um, outside of like the teaching sphere has been really, really valuable. I've gotten some really good feedback from some of the students about that, um, just that interaction. So it's been, it's been a really, really great, uh, good experience. Well, thank you, Karen and Meredith for sharing. Um, the how the year's gone. I love that you've enjoyed the hybrid opportunity and the focus to the rainbow and those projects. So thank you so much. And our final presenter is Lynn Scott with Principia, who's also going to be providing a Green Schools Press project update as well. So Lynn, the floor is yours. Thank you. And wow, what a lineup today. Thank you so much to everyone. It's really just been phenomenal. Um, so I, I guess I'll just share kind of an update of some of the things that we're working on at Principia. Um, the, the first one, I guess, is a plug and, and I'll say, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I don't feel like I have these, like, nothing's tied up in a pretty bow. Nothing is like, has these great measurable outcomes, um, for, for this immediate, these immediate pieces that I'm talking about. The first one is, um, we've worked really hard on, um, well, submitting an application to be a green ribbon school, but with that, um, getting started on the Energy Star portfolio. I feel like um, that's something that I have been wanting to do for a really long time. And finally, this year, we finally took those steps and took the time to enter the bills and um, really start to get a look at our school's energy data. Um, and I, I guess if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it um, as it, it, we want, all of us, we want data to inform our practices. And it really is a powerful and pretty simple tool um, with, with support, I needed support, um, to provide some benchmarking data. And already, I mean, again, I said, I, I don't have things tied up in this beautiful bow, but already meeting with my facilities groups, um, we've been able to use data to say, okay, we want to do 
um, like there's a renovation plan for one of the academic wings of our building. And so now we have some benchmark data to be able to say, okay, if we're going to make these changes, now we can actually identify, um, is it making a difference in our, uh, in our energy benchmark? So I think that's really, um, that's a really powerful piece. Um, that I'm really excited about kind of the trajectory and how we can really um, take action on that. The next piece that I'm excited about is um, I teach a sustainability class. I should have prefaced what I do. <laughs> I teach, uh, I'm a high school teacher. I, um, I teach sustainability, uh, field of natural history, sometimes biology. Right now I'm teaching STEM too. Um, and I'm also the Principia School Sustainability Coordinator. And the school itself is early childhood through 12. Um, I mostly interface with the high school students, but um, today, for example, I got to spend an hour and a half with fourth graders. So sometimes I get to, you know, move around, which is fun. Um, but something that we've been able to do in sustainability class this year is, um, and I'm most happy to see Lou Rooney on the call, um, We've been able to partner with Climate Reality Group um, and also with the Director of Sustainability for St. Louis, Catherine Werner. And Catherine was looking for a way to essentially spice up um, some PDFs that she has around climate action, um, climate action at work, climate action at home, and then even thinking about what can climate action look like at school. And so, um, and I had been connecting with Climate Reality Group and we kind of um, have, have partnered together. It's a brand new little connection here that we're doing. And really um, taking these documents and the information and working to update them. So we're, we're really within the first couple of weeks of this work right now. Um, my students for the first week looked at them. They identified the things they liked, the things that I said, well, would you actually look at this? And they said, no. And I said, why? And now they're, they're thinking about the design process and infographics and what's really going to catch people's eyes. And, and those in that age group identifying what's gonna be impactful and what's gonna be effective. So that's been fun. We're now kind of moving into those content pieces to identify how can we engage the community, not just our school community, but the, the broader community into these actions, thinking about climate action at work, at home, and at school. So it's a beginning partnership. Um, I always get really fired up being able to connect with um, organizations. So I really thank the Climate Reality Group for. Uh, working with us and, and with the students. They've been great. Um, we've had two Zoom calls so far together, and we're kind of, you know, uh, working in that vein um, to kind of give them updates on Zoom and, and you know, here's what we've learned. So, so that's exciting. Um, and as we know, as, as educators, anytime our students can do something that um, is authentic, and there is a, an audience that is, I mean, I, I can't create this audience, like the audience is real, you know, they're, they're going to stand at Earth Day and hand out these QR, the QR codes to these, you know, these PDFs, like that's, you know, you can hardly create that in the classroom, you know, it has to just be authentic to really have that. And so that, that feels powerful. And, you know, so many people, I, I just can't say enough, there's so many organizations that want to work with our youth, that are happy to work with our youth. And yes, the scheduling can get really crazy, um, but I guess in my experience, it's, it's worth it. So I'm really excited by these next steps. Again, nothing's tied up in a pretty bow, but I'm, I'm excited about the next steps that are happening. Wonderful. And I'm so excited, Lynn, just because personally, we've had a friendship for over a decade. And just to see the journey that's been occurring with Principia and the area, it's it's just wonderful. So congrats, Lynn, for becoming um, a green school and that application and well, as well for being a green ribbon school. And we're very excited to see what's to come. So thank you again. And thank you everyone for joining us once again this afternoon for an amazing presentation of inspiration of change makers with our kids and connecting truly across the state. Incredible work is happening in Kansas City. Amazing um, tools are available to us in the St. Louis area as well because we all realize that climate change is real, that action needs to take place and our students are the future and the change makers to make this occur in our world and also creating the empathy and understanding to make the change even when it's hard. So so thank you all so, so much. Um, wrapping up this time, is there anyone who has questions that still wanted to be provided? 
It's open for sharing. I did have a quick question for Rebecca Weaver with um, the Nature Conservancy. I just, I know that you said that there was another similar tool in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but is there any other similar tools like the um, Eco Urban Assessment Tool for St. Louis anywhere else in the US? Hi, yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so there are some uh, models out there. They're called kind of green prints. So ours was a hyper local approach in that we worked with uh, organizers and community based organizations here, but there are similar um, projects and methodologies out there. Um, if you look um, for green prints specifically, it kind of looks at the intersections of flooding and air quality and tree canopy, for instance, uh, but those they are out there um, and we referenced other resources within that tool like the EPA's environmental justice um, EJ screen tool. So there are lots and in that um, story map and tool, there's a lot of other uh, projects that are referenced. So there should be some, some data points in there for you as well. Awesome, thank you. There's another organization out of Texas called um, EcoRise that has a new initiative called Gen Thrive, where they are working um, on doing similar mapping. It's it's really rooted in, um, or, or I guess one of their main goals is really to look at environmental education. But they are all are looking all mapping out all these different factors, um, and overlaying that with. Edu uh, environmental educational opportunities in these areas as well. Um, and I'll, I'll just pop a link to that in our chat box here too. Awesome, Hope. Thank you so much for sharing. And again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. What incredible, incredible resources that have been shared and amazing work by all. Hope is going to share this recording with us later this week. So it will be for further review. And then everything that was provided in the chat will also be um, shared as well in email to you for your with coinciding with your registration. Our next Green Schools Quest um, Connect on the Quest opportunity and speaker series will be occurring on March 31st. And this is gonna be a big one, especially for our schools as we share with you the transition from being a Green Schools Quest participant into potentially becoming a Missouri Green School and how easy that can be and how impactful it can be for your next steps in providing for ongoing sustainability efforts for your school and community. So we look forward to hopefully seeing all of you and many more um, coming up this March 31st, wishing you a great rest of your February. And thank you so much all, take care and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, great to see everyone.